Welcome back. Well, they're, they're working me ruthlessly here. So where have we been so far? We've been returning again and again to this cherished image of listening and this practice of listening within ourselves, within one another, within the body of the earth. We've been reflecting on what it is to be part of a new birthing that is for our of godness to come forth in radically new ways. <clears throat> We've been looking at some of the main characteristics of this rebirthing that is already stirring in our hearts and stirring in our yearnings. Last night we were looking at the yearning to come back into relationship with the sacredness of the earth, the sacredness that is at the heart of all things. This morning we've been reflecting so far on the yearning to come into relationship with the true wisdom of other traditions given to complete us. <clears throat> In this part of the morning, I invite us to reflect on coming back into relationship with the imagination. We are made in the image of the great imaginer. We are made in the image of the great dreamer. Thomas Berry, the eco-theologian whom I was referring to earlier, said the universe is so amazing it must have been dreamt into being. And it is like a shape-shifting dream. It just keeps unfolding into new form, new manifestation. But prophet as he was, Thomas Berry didn't leave his statement there. He went on to say, and we are in such a mess, ecologically, politically, internationally. We are in such a mess, he said, that we need to dream the way forward. That is, we need to allow ourselves to see new ways of relating, new ways of being. We need to draw from this living well of truth that is offering us new awarenesses and new consciousnesses, the likes of which we've never known. On Iona, there is the well of eternal youth, which I drink from deeply every time I'm there. <laughs> you didn't know I was 150 years old, did you? <laughs> the well of eternal youth clearly has pre-Christian significance. And not surprisingly, it is associated with Bridget of Kildare, the 5th century Irish saint. And wherever we find Bridget's name, as we do in many wells and many parts of the Celtic world, we can be fairly sure when we find her name that we're dealing with a site that has pre-Christian significance. Because Bridget straddles the pre-Christian and the Christian. She very happily lives in that meeting place between the Christian and the pre-Christian or between what is known and what is unknown. It was said that her mother was a Christian and her father or stepfather was a Druidic priest. Bridget is much loved in the Hebrides, the Western Isles of Scotland, and these islands called the Hebrides simply mean the islands of Bride, or the islands of Bridget. Legend has it that she was the midwife at the birth of the Christ child. Now, this poses no problem to the Celtic mind that a 5th century Irish saint 
should have been present at the birth of the Christ child in Palestine. Because what the imagination does is make two worlds one. Or it speaks from the one world that is deep within all worlds. So in part it is a way of speaking of the birth of the Christ now, in our culture, in our families, in each child that is born. Legend also described Bridget as the wet nurse for the newborn child. And this in part was a way of speaking of the way in which the gospel of Christ was suckled on the pre-Christian wisdom of the Celtic world. This radical continuity between the pre-Christian and the Christian. On Iona, it was said that Bridget would appear on midsummer night at the well of eternal youth. And she would appear at twilight. Well into the 19th century, it was practiced for people to gather at the well of eternal youth to invoke the aid, the blessing of Bridget. Those of you who have been to the Western Isles in the summer will know that in midsummer, <clears throat> midnight is still twilight. Darkness doesn't <clears throat> really fully come in the midsummer. So there's a little bit of darkness that comes around midnight and then the birds are singing their morning song again at about two in the morning. We pay for this in the winter. <clears throat> but the midsummer, midnight, twilight time is again a typical of Bridget time because it's the time of the two lights. It's the time of twilight is dominated neither by the sun nor by the moon, but rather a type of commingling of those two lights. We need to enter liminal time, liminal places, liminal spaces within us, <clears throat> between what we know and what we don't yet know. We're being invited to open to the imaginal to ways of seeing, ways of relating we haven't yet known. In the Celtic world, the twilight is a much cherished time. <clears throat> In much Celtic legend, it is when lovers meet and become one. The twilight is also the time <clears throat> when there is a greater glimpsing of those who have gone before us through the veil of death. And of course, in all the great meditation traditions, all the great spiritual traditions of the world, that time <clears throat> of the two lights in early dawn, when it's neither night nor day, is the time that is especially cherished for meditation. Because in the dawn of early morning, we're still somewhat in the dream world, we haven't yet moved primarily to the rational mind, but we're still attentive at deeper levels and open. The prophet that I invite us to listen to in this session <clears throat> is that prophet of the modern soul that I've already referred to, Carl Jung, 1875 to 1961, he can be seen as a prophet of the unconscious. He was uh, the founder of analytical psychology. He described himself as a student of the Pesuke, student of soul. And he believed that that's what we are all to be, students of the soul, listening to the messages of soul that will lead us into what we don't yet know. Jung says that we long for what lies beneath the surface. The treasure, he writes, lies in the depths of 
the water. Messages are coming up from the waters of the soul or the waters of the unconscious. Just like in the well of eternal youth on Iona, new life is forever coming up from deep within. Messages are coming up in the form of dreams, in the form of imagination and the imaginal. Let's be clear, though, about some of Carl Jung's terminology, and I apologize for those of you who already are fully acquainted with his terms, but just to make sure that we're all accessing him together. By the conscious, he is referring to what we already know, what we are conscious of. By the unconscious, he's referring to what we don't yet know or what we have forgotten. And he distinguishes between two types of unconscious. One, he says, is the personal unconscious. And by that, he's meaning everything we have ever experienced, everything we've ever sensed, everything we've ever heard, known, it's all there within our personal unconscious. And sometimes we find ourselves with the floodgates of the unconscious just opening. Sometimes at moments of grief, at other moments in our lives, when those floodgates open and we find ourselves remembering things that we had forgotten or didn't even know we knew. Other times we need to knock at those doors to try to retrieve some of what we've forgotten. But there's also what he calls the collective unconscious, which is just ours by birthright, that there is flowing within us all a type of stream of images, which he calls archetypes or first types. And these images or archetypes are forever coming up in new combinations to send us signals to invite us into a consciousness of what we have not yet known. Jung says that wholeness consists of bringing together again what has been torn apart the conscious from the unconscious, the east from the west, the day from the night, the feminine from the masculine, the head and the heart, spirituality and sexuality, the well-being of one nation, the well-being of another, all these so-called opposites. Wholeness consists of bringing these back into relationship. We live says Jung, in painful fragmentariness. We live often in a type of captivity to one end of the spectrum of so-called opposites. Jung sees the universe in terms that are very similar to Julian of Norwich. Remember, she was the one who said everything comes forth from the womb of God. Jung sees the universe as an unfolding of God. And what he notes is that the universe unfolds through paired opposites. Nothing exists without its opposite. There's the night and the day. There's the north and the south, the east and the west, the feminine and the masculine, the hot and the cold, above and below and so on. Jung says that life wants all days to be followed by night. In other words, the universe wants all these so-called opposites to exist, to coexist in a type of harmony of interrelationship. Yet we live in a captivity to opposites. <clears throat> So we live in the day. We know quite a bit about the day, but so much of our culture 
has known very little of the night. We pay very little attention to the dreams of the night and to the night's way of knowing. We live in the West. We know little of the East. We live in a world that has been dominated by masculine energy. We know very little of feminine wisdom of leadership. Jung speaks of <clears throat> what he calls moon-like consciousness. Moon, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> moon, <clears throat> it's getting worse. <clears throat> moon-like consciousness. <clears throat> as opposed to what he calls sun-like consciousness. <clears throat> Think of what it's like <clears throat> walking under the fullness of the moon at night. I know when I walk under the moon's feminine whiteness of light, <clears throat> I'm often speechless because what the moon's feminine softness of light is inviting me to remember is the oneness of everything that I'm in the midst of. The hard edges of day are softened and we more readily remember the interrelatedness and the oneness. Whereas when I walk under the bright sun of midday and occasionally I have that experience in Scotland <clears throat> I'm much more ready to speak analytically about the distinction and the uniqueness of the parts. Jung's point, of course, is that we need both. We need moon-like consciousness and sun-like consciousness. But that so much of our culture, so much of our religion has been dominated by sun-like consciousness. We know about individuality and the uniqueness of the parts, but we tend to live in a type of forgetfulness of the oneness from which we have come and the interrelatedness of the oneness of all things. Many years ago, I spent part of a winter in New Mexico, a time of solitude and writing, and it had been a very blessed time. So at the end of my time in New Mexico, I wanted on the last day to offer my thanks just as the sun was setting. So I climbed up one of the high mesas just as the sun was about an inch off the western horizon. The great fiery red globe and type of pulsating of red light across the desert. And as I was standing offering my thanksgiving, a raven flew just behind me. She, she came so close that I could hear her swoosh of her wings, but then she also called out. So I turned around and there was the full moon, just an inch off the eastern horizon this perfect equipoise between sun and moon or what the ancients call the music of the spheres. That everything has come forth from the womb of God to move in relationship. This perfect balance that happens every night of the full moon, but which we often live in unawareness of. The Hebrew scriptures offer us visions of the marriage of so-called opposites. Paradise is where the wolf will live with the lamb, where the leopard will lie down with the kid. Christian scripture too offers us a vision of the kingdom of God as the place where people will gather from east and west and sit at table together. Carl Jung speaks of the spirit as a conjunctio oppositorum, that is, as a conjoining 
of what is considered opposite. This is the work of the Spirit. The Spirit leads us into communion, which means one with, oneness with. When I was part of the ministerial team at St. Giles Cathedral, <clears throat> I had a dream. <clears throat> I didn't spend all of my time at St. Giles dreaming, uh, although I think probably a lot of the time. But I was in this dream, I was standing at the altar about to distribute the bread and the wine for communion. And in the dream, there was an altar cloth on the altar. And there was a lot of tension in the cloth. At one corner of the altar cloth, there was a group of Amnesty Inter International members pulling with all their might and passion in the direction of justice. And at the di diametrically opposite corner was a group of singers singing the most beautiful Gregorian chant. And they were pulling in the opposite direction. And there was so much tension in the cloth that I realized I, in the dream I realized I couldn't proceed with communion. It looked like the chalice was going to spill. The dream, I believe, was inviting me to know this tension. It's a tension in my heart. It's a tension in so many of us. How to hold on to the sacredness of justice and at the same time hold on to the sacredness of beauty. The dream was inviting me, I believe, to stand in between these, to look with loving kindness on the sacredness of beauty and aesthetics and at the same time to look with loving kindness on the great yearning for justice and to allow myself to be between these, looking at them with loving kindness, allowing a third thing, a third thing, <laughs> a new thing, to come into being within me. <clears throat> Carl Jung says the devil is a dualist. The devil is forever trying to tear apart what belongs together. The devil is trying to tear apart what belongs together, the oneness of the universe. <clears throat> At this point in our morning, I invite us to begin to begin to, in silence, to name within ourselves what are these so-called opposites in our lives? What are these things that we just can't imagine coming back into relationship? <clears throat> and perhaps we will begin to think of people Perhaps there will be other tensions that we're aware of. The tension between the well-being of my family and the family down the road. The tension that we feel between the well-being of our own nation and other nations. The enormous tensions that we've been in the midst of and are still in the midst of in political divide. We're being invited to look to the very heart of the other. Yes, to be part of prophetic passion and statement, knowing how to say no to what we believe is false and demeaning and driven by fear and hatred. But we're also being invited to look deeper into the true heart of the other the essence of all coming forth from God. So let's begin to name some of those within ourselves. 
in a way that we can take it into some of our meditative practice later on this morning. For in the soul from which everything has come, that soul within all souls, the so-called opposites are all interwoven. It's only out here in the conscious world that they've fallen into so-called opposition. I'd like to tell you a Scottish fairy tale, because often fairy tales are ways of pondering how the opposites can come back into relationship, and often there's a birth that happens in fairy tale when there's a type of resolution, something new is born. This fairy tale is by the Scottish writer George MacDonald, who in the 19th century was really the J.K. Rowling of Scotland. He wrote fairy tales and novels, and uh, his writings were massively popular. So one of his fairy tales was called Day Boy and Night Girl. Day Boy and Night Girl. And it's a tale of bringing back into relationship what has been torn apart. In the case of this fairy tale, it's what Carl Jung would call the supreme pair of opposites, the feminine and the masculine, which doesn't equal just male and female, but rather speaks of feminine energy and masculine energy that is deep within all things, but which often gets separated. The fairy tale begins by describing a wicked witch that has a wolf living in her heart. And what the wolf wants to do is rip apart what belongs together. And already in the tale, we learn that the witch has torn apart the heart of a royal family by stealing at birth their firstborn child, a boy, <clears throat> and giving the family the impression that the child has died in childbirth. But she has taken the boy and holds him in imprisonment in her castle. She's done to the, the same to a family of humble origin, in this case, a girl. She's taken the girl also to the castle, and she keeps the boy and the girl in separation, so they grow up not knowing of one another. The boy has golden, wavy hair like the sun, blue eyes like the midday sky. He's taught to read and to reason, and he spends much of his day out hunting the creatures. He's never allowed by the witch to experience, to fully experience the night. He's allowed only to experience the day. The girl, on the other hand, has jet black hair, dark, dark eyes. She's not, <clears throat> she's not taught to read or to study. She is taught only music. And she's never allowed to experience the day, only the night. And she spends her nights out roaming in the forests, being with the creatures that the prince hunts, that the boy hunts, now a young man, a prince hunts during the day. <clears throat> <clears throat> the turning point in the tale comes when one day the prince out hunting a lion follows the lion into the forest just as the sun is beginning to set. And on this occasion, he doesn't turn back to the castle before the sun sets. So when darkness comes, this normally brave prince is terrified by the night and is driven mad by the darkness, and he flees back to the castle and collapses in the garden courtyard of the castle. And there he is discovered by the girl who is now a young woman. 
She has never seen a young man before. So she's both frightened of the unknown, but immensely attracted. And she holds the prince, holds his head on her lap and soothes him. <clears throat> when he regains consciousness, he too is startled. He's never met a young woman before, but he's also deeply attracted. And it's together that they discover that they have been living half-lives, that they've been held in this sort of co uh, captivity to opposite ends of the spectrum. And together they plot their escape. And it's agreed that the young woman will guide them in the intimacy of the night that so terrifies the prince. And the prince will guide them during the day under the bright light of the sun that so blinds the young woman. When the witch discovers they have escaped together, she set, she is, she's furious and she spins in her rage and becomes the wolf, or the wolf consumes her, takes over, and sets off after the prince and the young woman to tear them apart. When they see the wolf approaching, the wolf takes out a bow and arrow and with one shot fells the wolf with an arrow to the heart. It's only then that they realize that the wolf is, in fact, the witch, <clears throat> and they realize they are now safe. When the king of the land learns this story, he gives them the witch's castle to live in, and they are married, and there is a birth. They have a daughter, and the daughter has <clears throat> black hair like the mother and blue eyes like the father. And the prince comes to love the day. The prince comes to love the night as much as the day because it is the realm of his beloved and she comes to love the day as much as the night because it's the kingdom of her prince. This is the story of, or a story, of the marriage of opposites. It's a story that also explores the painful fragmentariness in which we live, often at one end of the so-called opposites. It's a tale that explores also the shadow side within us that wants to rip apart rather than interweave. <clears throat> if Carl Jung had written the story, he wouldn't, of course, have killed the witch because the witch can't be killed. She is always with us. Always, there is the capacity in us to tear apart, to not be able to live in the interweaving and interrelating, but to rip apart. So the witch can't be killed, that shadow capacity within us. So the question is how to recognize that capacity within us that's often driven by fear without giving it its room to be destructive. The tale invites us also to know that within the opposites there is attraction. That moment when the prince and the young woman meet. Jung Carl Jung calls this the promise of union that is deep within everything that has being. This is his equivalent to Julian of Norwich, who we heard last night speak of the love, long, love longings of God. We are made of the one. Deep within us are these longings for oneness, even though they may lie buried, infected, 
covered over, lost sight of. They are there. It's what Jung calls the promise of union that is deep within all that has being. Our role is not to somehow think that we have to create the desire for oneness. It's there. We don't need to add anything to the human soul as we were hearing this morning. The question is how we can be part of liberating this promise of union or this love longing or this holy yearning for oneness. Our role is to be liberators, not implanters of something that isn't already in our soul and in the soul of one another. Messages from the unconscious or messages from soul are inviting us also to discover the bliss of union. This is part of what the fairy tale, ex fairy tale explores, the bliss of union. All of the great spiritual traditions of humanity, perhaps with the exception of much of our Western Christianity, recognize that true sexual union is an experience of the divine. Because in true sexual union, we forget our separateness while honoring and reverencing the uniqueness, the differentiation of the other. And the marriage of opposites, as we see in the tale, leads to pregnancy. This, says Carl Jung, is where God is born. I would prefer to say this is where God is reborn. This is where there's a rebirthing of the sacred when so-called opposites come back into relationship. The American writer Ken Wilbur speaks of the threefold journey into wholeness. He speaks of the undifferentiated oneness into which we are born. When we are born, we don't make any distinction between ourselves and our mother and everything about us. It's just all one. And then there's that very important development of the ego. The second stage he calls differentiation. When we learn to distinguish between ourself and our mother and everything around us. Wilbur's point is that we've got stuck at the second stage, differentiation, the assertion of the ego. And of course, he's not just speaking individually, he's speaking of how the enormous ego of our nationhood or of our species or of our religion or of our racial group or of our gender And in that, getting stuck in the second stage, he says, we forget the oneness from which we've come, and we live only in terms of differentiation. The third stage on the journey of, to wholeness, he speaks of as differentiated oneness. In other words, it is allowing the two first stages, undifferentiated oneness and differentiation, to marry, and they give birth to a third a third way that honors the differentiation, the uniqueness, the individuality of every part of any, every person while remembering this deeper oneness from which we have come. What gets in the way of the e uh, what gets in the way of this third stage, she says, is the ego. Carl Jung says that we need to celebrate a last supper with our ego. And not just once, but again, and again, and again. This is not about hatred for the self. This is a knowing that the ego claiming to be center 
is obscuring true relationship because it keeps forgetting the oneness that we are of and the oneness that represents our way of well-being. Right now, I can celebrate a last supper with my ego. I can turn my heart's attention to the heart of you. I can do it right now. And in another 20 seconds, I need to do it again. And this is what we owe one another, as we've already touched on this morning. What are the disciplines? What are the awarenesses? It leads not into a hatred of self, but rather this work of dissolving the way in which our ego, both individual and collective, tries again and again to claim the center ground. How can our Christian story serve the oneness? How can it serve this promise of union deep within all things? How can it serve this love longing of God that is planted at the very heart of our being? Part of what we are being invited to do at this moment in time is to dream our myth onwards, to allow ourselves to imagine new ways of seeing, new rituals, new teachings, new practices, to allow our Christian story to rise in ways that will carry great blessing for the world. Carl Jung says, God refuses to abide by tradition, no matter how sacred. Why is it we have ever thought that we, as a Christian tradition, have some sort of right to perpetuity? Why should we have any right to perpetuity? if we are not unfolding like the rest of the universe, if we are not bearing blessing for the world's unfolding and journey, we have no right to exist. Life is a flowing, it's not a stoppage. And if Christianity is to be part of this holy work of transformation, we're being invited to open to what we've never known before and to be in new ways for the world. Just as in sleep every night, we descend into the unconscious in order to be renewed. So our story needs to re-enter the imaginal, to be born anew. I remember one of the first times I taught with Rabbi Nachum in New Mexico. And I heard him saying to some of our participants, he said, now, when Philip teaches, it comes out Christian, but it goes in Jewish. <laughs> I agree, but in reverse. When he teaches Torah, he feeds me. He feeds my devotion to Jesus. How do we do this? We've been trained to think of ourselves as opposite in competition. But in fact, we've been given to deepen one another, to mature one another. The first time I taught with him, I was teaching in the mornings and then he was teaching Torah in the afternoons. And on the first morning, Nachum was there to watch a bunch of Christians primarily wrestle about the doctrine of original sin. So in the afternoon, he began Torah study by saying, we Jews don't have doctrine. 
What we have is the story. And every time we go back to the story, it says something new. Because every time we go back to the story, it's a new moment. And if you haven't studied Torah with a rabbi, I would, I would encourage you to seek out the experience. Because one of the beautiful aspects of study of Torah in the Jewish tradition is that no, no question is barred. No question is, is inhibited. We can ask anything of the story. There are no right and wrong questions. And we ask questions in order for the story to speak right into now. Whereas what we've done with Christian doctrine is that we've nailed down the story. We've tried to nail it down. We've taken the garden, the story of the garden and humanity's temptation and faith, faithlessness. And we've said, oh, that's what it means. It means the doctrine of original sin. So we nail it down. We kill the story. We don't allow it to speak anew. We take the story of the crucifixion of Jesus. We nail it down. Oh yes, it means substitutionary atonement. We don't let it breathe. We don't let it speak because we've decided that we know what it means. Jesus was a Jew. Guess how he taught? St. Matthew says, without a parable, he taught them nothing. It was story after story after story. And often he would end his stories by saying, decide for yourselves what is true. What's the story saying now? Often religion avoids this descent into the unknown world of soul. Because from the soul, we may be called to do what we've been trained not to do. Messages from the soul may call us to cross boundaries that have been taught as inviolable. We might be called to cross boundaries of nationhood, to begin to care for the well-being of other nations as we care for the well-being of our own nation. We might be called over boundaries that have separated us as religions, as classes, as races. This is exactly what we see happening in early Christianity Remember Peter's dream in Joppa? It's midday. He goes up onto a rooftop as lunch is being prepared. He has a dream. And in the dream, he sees a great sheet being lowered from heaven. It's four corners. And in the sheet are, there, are creatures of earth, sea, and sky and the voice addresses Peter. Peter, take, eat. And Peter responds as a good religious boy. He says, but Lord, I've never eaten what is unclean. And the voice responds, do not declare unclean what I have created clean. Do not declare unsacred what I have created sacred. Peter doesn't get it. So the dream needs to come three times. And we're not getting it. We keep dividing. We keep wanting to say but surely our nation is more sacred than another nation. Surely. 
I keep doing it as a father. Surely my family is more sacred than the family down the road. Surely I should be more committed to my family's education and health, even if it means the expense of the health and education of the child down the road. That's what my culture and religion has told me good fatherhood is. We're being, to break, we're being invited to break out of these boundaries. And messages of soul, messages that come from the oneness of our origin are inviting us into territory we haven't known. Messages are calling us into a big stretching to take on the labor pains of a new birthing. This dream of Peter's marks a new beginning. If the Christian story is to live again, we need to access the imaginal world of the unconscious, the imaginal world of soul. We're being invited to allow the story of Christ's birth to be reborn, to point not just to one child 2,000 years ago, but through that beautiful and cherished story to point to the heart of what is happening in the birth of every child. As Anthony de Mello, the Indian Jesuit, used to like to say, listen to the song the angels sang the day you were born. Listen to the song the angels are singing right now at the birth of every child. We're being invited to allow the story of the empty tomb to be reborn through that cherished story of resurrection that we receive, to look for it deep within every ending. As Oscar Romero of El Salvador said, when the military junta of that country was threatening to kill him because of his calls for justice and his work for his people, he, he said, if they kill me, I will rise again in the people of El Salvador. Anything that is of God, anything that is filled with true vision for justice, anything of God's wisdom, even when pushed to the ground, it will rise again. We are a resurrection people. We're being invited to allow the story of Pentecost to be reborn. Carl Jung calls it the Christification of the disciples. When they discover that the spirit that was in Christ is also in them and in Jerusalem, where people are visiting from all of the world, they speak a language, a new language, that can be understood by everyone visiting Jerusalem, we are being invited to speak from a place of oneness that will communicate beyond the boundaries that have separated us. Perhaps the least preached upon text in our Christian scriptures is Jesus saying, those who come after me will do greater things than I? Do we believe that? Because this is the language of love. This is how we speak about our children. We yearn that what they, what they will experience, what they will do, will be greater than what we have done. This is Jesus speaking the language of love. 
the well of soul within us is living. On Iona, on pilgrimage, when we visit the well of eternal youth, we kneel and we sip and we bathe our faces. And one of the things I notice at the well of, to, well of eternal youth, just about every time I visit it with pilgrims, what begins to happen is playfulness. People start splashing one another. People start saying, let's have a before and after photograph. Let's play at the well of the soul. Let's allow ourselves to play the way forward into ways of seeing, ways of being, ways of relating that we haven't yet known. Why are we so inhibited? In part because we've been trained to believe that there's a correct way of seeing, of saying, of relating. And we don't open ourselves up to play. And of course, in playing, we might make some mistakes. It's okay. If our heart is desiring new birth, it's okay if we make some mistakes. Because what we're yearning to do is to find new life, new birthing, new relationship, new well-being. Here at the well of eternal youth, just as at the well of the soul, we can seek Bridget's aid. We can seek her blessing. She is part of our household. She feels entirely comfortable at the liminal place between the known and the unknown. Her feast day is the first day of spring in the Celtic calendar. In the Celtic world, it's called Imolc, I-M-B-O-L-C, but pronounced Imolc. And what it means is in the belly. That's where new life is. It's in the belly of the earth, waiting to come forth in the spring. It's in the belly of the soul. New life wanting to come forth. We may not yet see with definition all the features of what is trying to be born, but it's stirring, it's wanting to come forth. Think of Peter at the first Christian Pentecost. He said, our young will see visions and our old will dream dreams. There's a lot of white hair in this room. Guess what we're being invited to do? We're being invited to dream dreams. And bring these dreams to our young who are so gifted at vision, who are so hungry for a new vision. And this is new birth. This is not just resuscitation of the old. Carl Jung makes the wise observation in looking at the Easter story in the Christian tradition. He says, the risen Christ is not found where his body was laid. This is not resuscitation. This is the radicalness of resurrection this is a new rising of Christ in us that we are being invited to be part of. Shall we open to it? I invite us again to move back into a chant before we begin to do some hearing from one another. And again, there'll be opportunity to hear from one another, first of all, in small groups of two or three, 
and then uh, an opportunity to move into a fuller hearing, anything you'd like to share with the entire group or anything you'd like to bring by way of question. But first of all, the chant that we'll use comes from the same recording that we used earlier this morning from Chanting for Peace. <clears throat> and some have been asking, by the way, about how to access these chants. They can be purchased as CDs, but you can also simply access individual tracks through iTunes. Um, and it all appears under, under my name. So you can uh, access any of these chants for your own use that way. So the chant that we'll be using now is uh, based on words of Jesus. And the words are, do not be afraid. I am with you, always. Do not be afraid. I am with you, always. And you'll hear a, a descant running through the chant, and it's in Aramaic, the language of Jesus. And what you'll be hearing is Alaha Hea, Alaha Hea, which means God is life, the life within all life. Do not be afraid. I am with you always. After we sing the chant, I invite us into a few moments of silence just to continue the discipline after the chant. And during that time, just pay attention. Not so much a thinking about the themes, just pay attention to what is trying to stir what's coming up from the well. Our chant, words of, based on words of Jesus, do not be afraid. I am with you, always. An opportunity now to hear from one another. First of all, in small groups, just groups of two or three, whoever you're seated next to or with. A time to share what's been calling your deep attention, what's trying to come up, uh, what's shining for you. And if uh, we do that for a number of minutes, and if you could keep half an eye up here, and when I raise my hand, if you could raise your hand and bring to a close what you're sharing, then we can move back into the full group. And there are uh, roaming microphones, and if there's anything you want to bring to the whole group by way of observation or question, that's the time to do it. But first of all, small groups. What's moving within you? Thank you. So we have two roaming microphones, one on each side. If, you, uh, if there's anything you would like to share, comment on, make observation about, ask a question, if you could raise your hand and we'll make sure that you get a microphone. I know I'm not going to like this question the minute I ask it. <laughs> but as, if we, if we, as we move from individuals to some collective and we enter this rebirthing process, how and when do I redefine an old term and keep the old term for tradition's sake and when do I give up an old turn and invent an entirely new turn? Yes. <laughs> Good question. And of course, there's no, there can be no prescriptive answer, but um, I think it's an important question to be asking and to... Um, to be sure that we, uh, that we don't absolutize any of our phrases, any of our language, any of our rituals, uh, that everything is being called to unfold. And uh, there are certain words uh, 
that we find it really difficult to reimagine, of course. You know, a, the term like the, a term such as God, for instance. Uh, I mean, the problem, primary problem with this term is that when we use it, we think we know what we're talking about. And uh, it's just metaphor. And yes, it is. Um, I was telling my friend Stephen Carlin about uh, Martin Buber, the great Jewish theologian. And when he was a young man, he heard Paul Tillich speaking in Germany. This was before the war. And uh, the story is told by Tillich years later. And in the lecture, Tillich was saying the word God is unrede unredeemable. We can't use it anymore because it's been so associated with the transcendent one. And what we're uh, needing is to recover the sacred immanence. And the, the word that he found his way to uh, was ground of being. God is ground of being. So he was saying, this is an unredeemable word. We can't use it anymore. And the young Buber stood up at the back, and they hadn't yet met. And Buber, uh, as a young man, said to Tillich, we cannot let go of this word because it is a primal word. He wasn't meaning that it was anything other than metaphor, but he was meaning it comes from so deep within our inheritance. We don't know when this word was first used. It's so deep. So let's do everything we can to keep the language that comes from that very primal place. And Tillich tells the story, and um, he concludes the story by saying, Buber was right. Now, that didn't put uh, Tillich off trying to find language. And I think it is the responsibility of every generation to be working on fresh language, allow it to unfold, allow our imagination to find new utterances. But I, um, I have a lot of sort of sympathy with where Tillich got to, that I certainly uh, cherish uh, turning our creativity in part to how our inherited language can be redeemed. But let's not absolutize it. Uh, Tillich says in one of his uh, final sermons, and this one appears in the book called Shaking the Foundations, and uh, he's preaching on that passage from the prophecy of Isaiah the words, I'm about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? And Tillich says in that sermon, as long as we think that the new thing can only come through the old thing, then we're in danger of missing the new thing. As long as we think that God is so bound, <laughs> limited, to working through our tradition, through our language, through our ritual, through our sacrament and teachings, then we're, we're in big danger, and we're in danger of missing the new thing. So uh, I think it's a matter of keeping our heart's attention on what really is addressing the deep yearnings of the human soul now. And if that involves letting go of some of our most cherished language, then I believe we're, that's the sacrifice that we're being called into. And I, you know, I forever struggle with, with trying to redeem some of our inherited language. And uh, one of the words I, I even think is redeemable is the word redemption. But let's be alert to how to even speak this old language um, in ways that don't carry so much of the 
the baggage and limitation and boundaries of the old that we don't um, find the way to speak this new language, this Pentecost language, this language that addresses the oneness of the human soul? Very important question. And I think I'm saying let's just wrestle away. <laughs> before, before we leave this place, I hope we'll hear from Sophia, the wisdom. Yeah, right here, the second row. And I, I see one. <laughs> One of the latest books that uh, Marcus Borg wrote before his untimely death, I don't remember the title. I wonder if you can turn the mic slightly so that it just goes right directly to you. That's it. You've got it. Yeah. It's what? Yeah. Uh, I don't think so, but it dealt completely with the subject of, of Christian language. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm, I don't remember the title, but uh, it was it's uh, very useful, I think. But yeah. salvation is one very loaded word, yeah. and born again, and yeah. many others. But I just happened to think of that. Yes, thank you. Marcus Borg's last publication. Steve, right in the middle here. I've heard the story of uh, your daughter who danced in India a number of times, and <clears throat> it really uh, captures my imagination, but I think that uh, since, as you pointed out, there's much white hair here, many, many years of tradition and, and uh, wisdom, uh, I think all we have to do is really think of what our children and our grandchildren are doing as evolutionary or revolutionary or different. Uh, they will all be fine, and and they'll do things differently than we have. And I think we should take time to think about what they're doing, not as, well, they're not doing what we did, and, and that's not appropriate, but really lift them up and do everything we can to continue yeah. to promote their efforts. Because I know you've been transformed by Kirsten's experience of five years in India, and likewise we have by our children. and those with grandchildren, uh, there's a lot of good things going on, but they certainly are not doing what we did, and that's yes. okay. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. That's, uh, that's so important. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm often asked in my travels, uh, how are we going to bring the young back into the church? And I always respond by saying, that's not my question. Why would we want to bring the young back into the church? Uh, they've, for the most part, left the church because they're not being fed. They're not being nurtured. That part of their holy desire, and they have some, they have some very immediate ways to access some of these yearnings that we've been talking about. They much more immediately uh, many of them are are looking to live in relationship with the sacredness of the earth. Many, our generation has had to learn um, learn our way out of some of our cultural inheritance and education to relearn the sacredness. Similarly, with other wisdom traditions, what I see my um, the the generation of my children doing is just. Of course, you know, uh, if Buddhist practices around meditation offer me an access to a greater awareness and compassion, you know, of course, you know, so that they, they, whereas some of us have had to really struggle towards breaking out of boundaries. So part of the way forward is what they know and what they are embodying often and living. And we need to be in relationship with that, with them. And that is my passion, that we should find ways of being in relationship with them, true, reverent uh, relationship. And whenever there's relationship, as I was trying to say this morning, when there's true relationship, there will be pregnancy. Something new will be born. And... Um, 
So the priority for that, for us and that younger generation, let's seize every moment of being in true relationship. But let's not approach the relationship thinking what they need is to come back into uh, a tradition. Uh, and if we're in true relationship, I believe that there will be new birthings that we don't know nothing about yet. And also, let's let's be confident. I loved what you were saying about they they will be fine. They will be well, because part of what we see them doing is following some of these deep instincts for the sacred and for reverence beyond boundaries and for um, an awareness of the sacredness of the earth. Sometimes as I am speaking and, and referencing the collapse of Christianity as we have known it, uh, people will sometimes say, well, but what will happen to Jesus if Christianity collapses? <laughs> and I say, we don't have to worry about Jesus. I mean, he's all about resurrection. I mean, that's what, <laughs> that's what Jesus does, right? So... Um, there will be, you know, the, the wisdom of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus will not be lost. And one only has to, um, to as I was trying to say earlier, uh, um, people all over the world are accessing uh, the wisdom of Jesus' teaching about how we are to treat our enemy. And um, so Christianity is not doing much to hold that one up. So the collapse of Christianity as we have known it is not going to lead to uh, a disappearance of, of Jesus' offering. Thank you. I have been reminded today of my granddaughter, my youngest granddaughter. I have four granddaughters, blessed with four. But she she is 19 now, and she is a sophomore in college. And the whole family kind of prayed Madeline through school, I think, because she would be a good scholar and then all of a sudden get tired and just kind of, you know, drear away. But when she was nine years old, she's, she's always lived in Birmingham and in the same house. And when she was nine years old, they were told, several school children were told to draw pictures and write a poem about their picture. Madeline's picture was a division, and here was dark, and here was light. It was not a division this way, it was a division on the diagonal. And she had the moon up here in the dark, and the sun here in the light. And her poem was about how we did, you know, her poem was written in both of those dimensions. And, and it was about being a part of the day and the night. Mm. And do you know it won the city of Birmingham's offerings of uh, school children, mm. writings and artwork of school children. And you have helped me to understand that, how the, um, that's important. Um, and it does give you hope, you know, about children growing up and, and becoming the individuals that they need to be. Mm. Thank you. And, um, you know, just but every great spiritual tradition of humanity has has known to celebrate the child and to such as these belongs the kingdom of God and um, they part of what the child holds before being educated out of it is uh, is this desire to be in relationship um, Martin Buber the same Jewish teacher comments on how the child um, in, in the child's sort of pre-verbal state, very young, the infant, uh, 
will, when they hear a sound, they'll, they'll try to respond to it. It's this, what Buber calls the, uh, in, the thou instinct, that the, the child uh, longs to be in relationship with everything around him or her. Um, and the, it's, so it, to such as these belongs the kingdom of God, we find these echoes in all of the great traditions. And it underlines the, the point I was trying to make earlier that we don't need to um, implant this. It's already there. And it may have got covered over. It may have become infected uh, in all sorts of ways within us as we age. But we're calling for a rebirth, sort of a, a letting loose of this child's way of seeing. It is of God, and um, and that uh, that I find, as you as you were saying, immensely hopeful. Because it's not up to us to somehow engineer this way of seeing. It's not about teaching something that isn't already in our listeners. It's about finding the ways to to set it free again. Uh, and to bow before that way. Yeah. Thank you. I think we have time for one more comment. One of the things I found as I get older is that I become a more and more a believer in Gomer Pyle's doctrine of God. Surprise, surprise, surprise. <laughs> uh, that new thing is, is, I think, one of the new things that God does is his surprises for us. Thank you. Wonderful way to end. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, there's an urgent question down here. Last night in the great room, you spoke briefly about the Celtic tradition school, and a lot of these folks weren't here, and you didn't go in any great depth. Could you speak to that just a little bit? I know we can probably go on your website and find out some information, but I think that's something that might be a seed that we would want to look into. Right. Now, I, I promise I didn't plant this question. <laughs> One of the things we're just on the sort of verge of setting in place, and it'll start happening in 2017, are, um, is the School of Celtic Consciousness. And this will be meeting in four places in 2017. These are three-day events. We're calling it a school rather than simply a retreat because we envisage that uh, people will come back year after year to do three things, really. One is to um, deepen our vision by receiving from some of the great teachings uh, over the centuries in this, in this tradition of Celtic spirituality. And, and this is you know, not, not to become a Celtic fundamentalist and say that this is what everyone needs, but this tradition does hold great treasure for now, for this moment in time. So the school is designed to deepen our uh, accessing of that wisdom and our, uh, allowing that wisdom to be a major resource for our thinking and living today. So one is to deepen understanding and vision. The second is to deepen spiritual practice uh, in relation to this vision. Um, in other words, to access the strength of soul that we've been speaking of. What are the simple practices that we can be part of, both individually and collectively, that can help us um, daily and repeatedly access that soul strength that is within us, made of God? And then the third is, to how, how do we translate this vision and this practice into action together? Um, so these will, these school, the school will be gathering in um, four places, and the, the hope is that as people are um, engaging in the annual schools, but also in quarterly gatherings from the schools, there will be uh, a greater alertness and a greater strength to asking 
well, how are we in this part of the country being invited to ground this, to apply it, to bring it to the issues of our nation or the issues of our of our communities? How do we turn vision and, and spiritual practice into action together? So the, uh, the four uh, locations are um, related to the four seasons. So the winter uh, location in January will be California. The spring location will be Colorado. The summer, early summer location will be New England. And the fourth, the autumn location will be Virginia. And uh, I know that Bill is thinking about a fifth location. Um, yeah, <laughs> well, um, somewhere more accessible in the south. Um, and uh, of course, our hope is that there will be more uh, manifestations of the school. But um, this is how I'm going to be tending it or nurturing it uh, for the next number of years to um, to establish a model of learning, of reflection, of action that, uh, of course, we hope will will be able to be multiplied. Yeah. So thank you for that, <laughs> that question. Um, and, um, yeah, the website is the place to find out the details of when it's meeting and so on. May I close with a prayer? And um, then I'm going to be available, if you wish, to... And to sign books, and that will happen out in the library space. This is a prayer from Praying with the Earth. To the home of peace, to the field of love, to the land where forgiveness and right relationship meet, we look, O oh God, with longing for Earth's children, with compassion for the creatures, with hearts breaking for the nations and people we love. Open us to visions we have never known. Strengthen us for self-givings we have never made. Delight us with the oneness we could never have imagined that we may truly be born of you, makers of peace. Amen. <laughs>